<laughs> Note yourself. Um, so yeah, um, health and safety stuff. <laughs> Sorry, bear with me, ladies and gents. There we go, it worked. <laughs> um, emergency exits, follow the green signs, um, follow the people um, walking calmly and not panicking. Eh? Uh, out to a mustering area, and that's outside in the quad. Um, the toilets, if you haven't found them already, it's a it's a bit of an amazing race scenario. You'll pick up your clues from the concierge over there, and then you'll run around the building a little bit to, and there'll be other clues as to where the toilet. Oh, I'm kidding. Um, it's uh, it's out the door, left, left, and then right, and you should see them. Okay, left, left, and then right, and then you've got to ask someone where to start from. <laughs> that's a bad joke, right? It's the it's the old Irish joke. Um, yeah, uh, if we could please keep the, uh, the place clean and tidy, I think we need to go back one. Actually, do I need to go over those? We're all grown-ups. Is that cool? No smoking in the room, please. Right? This is not 1982. The whole campus? Are you serious? Like, even this part of the campus? Sweet. And this part? Yeah. Also smoke-free. Damn. All right, cool. Um, so we've got that. Whole smoke, whole, whole campus is smoking, so you're allowed to smoke anywhere on the campus. That's cool. <laughs> Should be fairly obvious. Right? <laughs> All right, digital citizenship, uh, citizenship, and um, we've got a live stream, and um, we've got we have an awful, uh, awfully awesome amount of engagement online for these events. So people are commenting on the live stream, they're finding out about each other digitally. Um, we hope and we love it when you folks. Um, get engaged and you get out and social and we do the thing um, and and I think it's there's a, a certain duty of care for organizers like us uh, to make sure that we're keeping the space clean and clear uh, and um, friendly for all and, and, and inclusive all right so I think that's our request out there is digital citizenship really matters and um, when in doubt just be respectful and be ethical <laughs> um, and that's those are kind of good guidelines right so there's no knots in there, are there? Okay, okay sweet. Cool, um, so uh, welcoming audience, I'm kind of ticking off my boxes. Um, so I think tonight uh, my job is to help us all have a great time. We're gonna be moving through an agenda, we've got a program uh, that's been designed and implemented and prepared by an amazing crew uh, behind the scenes and we'll be saying a big thank you to them a little bit later as well. Um, but we it's have really a pretty awesome lineup. Uh, my job tonight is really um, to, to keep us moving um, but also to keep it light and keep it fun. Um, and my ask of you, all right, I have three asks of you. Uh, number one is to be open to different perspectives. We're going to be exploring a topic like manufacturing. Um, what are the different points of view in there? Uh, we're going to hear three of them. But actually, they're not the only ones with a point of view. All of you have a point of view. So I just want to encourage you to use the breaks, use the networking moments to, to kind of pull those ideas apart and, and add to them and you know, activate a bit of wisdom in the room. Okay, um, so number two is, can you please take some learnings away? We'll get you to share them every now and then, just to kind of, wow, let's get a sense of what's actually occurring, what's, what's landing for people, what are we taking from these events? And it's not just about networking. And then number three is, it's about networking. <laughs> um, so, so many of our uh, problems are, are more connected than the solutions. And I'm staring at a room full of people that are trying to work on solutions to the bigger challenges in the world. Um, and so it really, I think it's a, a massive opportunity for us while we have this privilege of being in a country that is relatively COVID free and um, while the rest of the world is going crazy, um, let's use this as an opportunity to tighten the mesh of this community. All right, so meet as many people as you can tonight. It's more important than networking. It's actually really, really important for shaping what happens next. So please, that's my ask of you tonight, is meet more people, um, get out of your comfort zone um, and connect and even keep those conversations going long after we finished here. Um, so that's, those are my three asks. Are those too hard to, uh, to are there, is, it, is that reasonable on a scale of one to 10? We're all clapping there, sweet. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you team. Paperwork here, hands, paperwork. Ah, oh, we've done the program. Um, you should have had that beforehand. Um, tell you a little bit about, about um, Tech Talk. Um, look, it's been such a privilege to be alongside the founders, Masood, and uh, and the organizing team, and, and Tectorium was born out of a crazy idea uh, uh, over there, and Masood's just taken it and led it into something that's pretty special. And I can't believe I'm looking at about, what, about 80, 90 people in the room? Is that right? 
Hey? Yeah, he, he's got data. You want data, this guy's got data. Um, so look, the, the vision here, um, the, the world that we believe in, if I may, um, that doesn't exist yet, um, is one where STEAM skills, the STEAM skills shortage gap in particular, is a thing of the past. Right? It's something that in 20 years time we look back on and we go, wow, what a, what a crazy time, man. We just didn't have enough talent filling these big gaping, voiding holes in our businesses and organizations, right? Um, that digital is actually leading the charge and we're really on the front foot um, of that sort of thing, right? Um, so that's our vision. Um, and yeah, and I think I'm curious about, uh, about uh, what, uh, what the Industry 4.0 topic has to bring to that conversation. Um, and I think if we can democratize learning in the way that Masood and his team have been doing, um, I think we're in better shape than we were before. Um, so it's thanks to uh, all those supporters and for all of you to kind of connect with this um, that's going to that's gonna shape what happens next. But I'm actually really curious about what brought you along tonight. So in a newly introduced tradition, this will be the second one, <laughs> I'm going to ask you to take a moment and just formulate your thoughts for the introverts in the room that don't like being ambushed with a, with a question and a microphone and a spotlight. <laughs> take a moment and think about, hmm, why did I brave the weather? Why did I go through the labyrinth that is the Unitech um, campus layout to kind of do this mystery tour to find this amazing treasure of a room with full of awesome people. So why did you come along tonight? Take a moment and think about that. Now I'd like you to take a look around the room and find someone you don't know yet, you haven't met yet. And quickly introduce yourself and share why you're here. Go. <laughs> I I volunteer here, so. Okay. Are you that Unitech or do you volunteer this? No, I'm not Unitech. I go to like a different polytechnic, which is like in your market. But I hear Unitech's pretty good, so. Yeah. Yeah, I'm in my secret unit. And yeah, I've just got the bar that's talking about the private station. I even talked to the guy who made all those 3D printing models. Yeah, all Yeah, all of Oh my god. Yeah, he's so cool. I remember he was telling me about how you got like the printing from it. He's just like, oh yeah, I just asked them for it. And they ordered in like 300,000 like, yeah. But um, Yeah, he's so passionate about it. I was like, can you make like a jewelry? And he's like, you can. He's you can. got the ring. You can make it. Yeah. That's so cool. Like, He's so humble, like you wouldn't know by looking at him, but he's like, I think, I saw a thing on LinkedIn saying that University of Auckland was one of the only places in New Zealand, like one of like five or six that have these 3D printing or public places yeah, that have like um, AUT, they actually put one. Oh, really? It's, yeah, yeah, but it's closed, like you can't, unless you're working there, yeah. you can actually go. And my friend, she was doing her final year project, which was oh, yeah. based on a 3D printing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. funny because like I used to think that 3D printing was only used in that kind of like mechanical sector thing, I guess. But I'm gonna ask Olaf about it. He said that most of the people who use or who like his students and people who work with them who use that kind of thing, they go up into a lot of them go into firstly startups. So they found like some sort of niche and they can do like a design of their product without having to go into like the whole manufacturing line that yeah. is earning thousands of dollars. Like a, like and, a pro, uh, physical yeah. prototype. Like yeah, like physical prototype. prototype. Yeah, and things like with printers so accurate. Like you don't that's, really need Yeah, that's so accurate. Have you seen the one that's like the tube? Yeah, yeah, like yeah, a, yeah. It's like a, it's like art in there. Yeah, 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 I've seen that. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. And then other one, um, all right, ladies and gents, let's bring it back in again. So just wrap up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other one was minimal science. You said that they end up going into, and I, that was like really surprising. Me. But you can do 3D presses are so good now. They can produce like organs, even like people specific organs. They can do like a scan of like this person's organs or that person's organs. They can 3D print them. So the surgeons can do like a pre-surgery training thing when they can be like, oh, this organ is bigger than that. Yeah, I think, like, 
the first training printer was in the first was in the I was doing like five, ten years or something. Yeah. I was like, oh yeah, that's cool, yeah, but how can you use yeah. it? Yeah, it'll never be like, make a big impact. And now, one of my friends who was like, he was so excited to talk to me the other day, he has this business. Right, ladies and gents, them. let's bring it back in. Not enough time, but he found a thing for a business for an RC car producing thing. Thank you. I, I wonder if we could just get, one, let's get three shout outs. Um, if I could get three things that came up in conversation. Why are you here? What have you heard tonight? Someone wants to replace everyone with robots and you thought you'd come along to see how that's done. Cool. I got one. Two more. Who else? When you heard an introduction now, why are people here? Susan and welcome and thank you. Wow, that's awesome. That's two. That's a healthy two. Can I get a three? <laughs> Boom. You learn so much just by talking to random people, like even casually. Right. It's amazing. Yeah. Works at the bus stop too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Ben. That's three. Thanks, everyone. Has everyone kind of checked in? Yeah. Um, I have the very great pleasure to welcome Nick Shepard in tonight. Um, he sadly couldn't make it in person. But he's here using the power of technology. Eh? I can't even say that properly. The internet. Um, so Nick is the Deputy Chief Executive um, Schools and Performance for both Unitech and the Manukau Institute of Technology. Um, ladies and gentlemen, can you please put your hands together for Nick? He's going to welcome us. How's that? Ah, there we go. Kia ora, kia ora tātou. Uh, no mai, haere mai, uh, whakatau mai rā. Uh, I aku ranga tera, I aku mana kura, tēnei te mihi mai a kia koutou. Uh, kua tai tēnana mai e tarangi nei, ki te hua tahi ai mō te kaupapa o te rā, uh, Māori ora. Uh, ko Nick Shepard tāko ringawa, uh, ko au titahi o te rūpu uh, kai whakahaere matua te whare wānanga o wai rāka, Fari Takiora o Manako, Noraira, Atena Koto Katoa. Respected guests, industry leaders, Unitech Fano, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the 15th Tech Talk seminar here at Unitech, Te Fariwananga o Wairaka. Unitech is a significant provider of vocational education and training uh, in New Zealand and is committed to enabling better futures for students, communities, and public and private enterprise. In order to deliver the best possible outcomes for our students and graduates, we undergo constant refinement, discipline around benchmarking, and rigorous measurement of our progress against industry and national and international benchmarks. Digital technologies are transforming virtually all aspects of New Zealanders' lives. Technology and the ICT technology sector is incredibly important to the New Zealand economy. New Zealand has over 30,000 tech firms employing over 100,000 employees and contributes approximately $16.5 billion to our national GDP, as well as producing a little over 6 billion in our tech exports. We are globally recognized as a nation based upon innovation, quality, ease of doing business, and a country which is flexible and trustworthy to do business with. And now, more than ever, there has never been a better time to be involved in the digital technology sector. Unitech, like many of you, aspires to be at the leading edge of this opportunity and is committed to working with you to ensure your future workforce has the skills, the training, and the knowledge to deliver and build upon and add value to the needs of your sector. We have always worked in collaboration with our stakeholders to advance training, knowledge and expertise across the IT sector. Authentic partnership is core 
to the Unitech Kaupapa. With this in mind, Unitech strongly supports initiatives such as Tech Talk that bring technological innovators, subject matter experts, industry leaders, educators, and learners together to both foster collaboration and networking and share knowledge on transformative technologies. Tech Talk has been actively working to connect industry and academic sectors in order to enable them to share their experiences and knowledge on innovative technologies, and we welcome that initiative. We have enjoyed a wonderfully positive relationship with Tech Talk for a number of years and greatly value and appreciate this partnership. I'm sure that you will all feel enriched with newfound knowledge and contacts and networks after this event and look forward to many more in the future. Finally, I welcome you all once again to the seminar to Unitech Te Whare Wānanga o Wairaka and hope that you all have a wonderful evening tonight. Thank you all for your attendance. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kura tātou katoa. Kia ora. Thank you, Nick. We'll be uh, moving on with the show, shall we? Oh, can you see me? Oh, there you go. Aha, sounds good. Enjoy your evening. Thank you. Sorry, I can't be there. All right. So while Masood grac graciously uh, does the switch over. Um, so tonight's speakers, uh, hang on a second, we're just waiting for a signal. Look at that, miraculous. Um, we're going to switch to the next slide. Did that work? Yes, it did. There we go. Um, right, so we've got three amazing speakers tonight. Very, very, very grateful for them to uh, share their perspectives with us. Um, they come from three totally different worlds by the look of things, right? We've got motion design out in the industry, and I was talking to a few people tonight um, doing some amazing work in the dairy space, but they um, have a, a bunch of things going on in automation. We've got um, uh, the, uh, oh, that's right, it was um, uh, Robert Blash from, um, from Callahan Innovation, and we've got Professor Olaf Deagle. Um, so we've got a, a, a three amazing perspectives to draw from tonight. It'll be about 15 minutes each, and then we'll stop for drinks and nibbles at the end. So uh, not the usual four that we're used to. Um, and yeah, I think we should be good to go. Again, the focus is on manufacturing tonight. Um, so uh, Frontier stuff, uh, you know, Industry 4.0, it's, it's kind of bringing that future closer. And um, by all accounts, it's arriving faster than we ever expected. <laughs> and in a form that often doesn't look as familiar as we would have thought. Um, so we'll get to our first speaker tonight. And I'm gonna ask us at the end of the talk to just prepare one or two things that you're taking from the talk to exchange with somebody next to you. So just bear that in mind for the introverts in the room that need a little preparation, eh? like me. <laughs> awesome. Um, so our first speaker tonight is Professor Olaf Degel, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Um, professor of Additive Manufacturing at University of Auckland. Um, Olaf is both an educator and a practitioner of additive manufacturing, and I can't wait to find out exactly what that is, because I have to confess, I don't know. Um, mechatronics, product development, with an excellent track record of developing innovative solutions to engineering problems. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Professor Olaf. So that's what I'm about. Now, I do have a background in mechatronics and robotics, 
but it was sort of before the days of Industry 4.0. So I confess I'm coming to that due to Industry 4.0 from an ignorant perspective, but hopefully that'll provoke a bit of thought amongst you. And really wondering about you know, what Industry 4.0 and what it's about, and particularly over the last three, four, five years, a lot of talk about Industry 4.0, and in my personal opinion, often people are talking about iPhones and apps and widgets, and they almost forget about the manufacturing side. And to my mind, you've got all these widgets, but if you're making them the same way you've been making them for 100 years, well, is that really proper Industry 4.0? You need to be bringing this modern manufacturing, advanced manufacturing. I will talk about additive, but I mean all uh, manufacturing you know, to make it work or to make it truly Industry 4.0. Slides are not quite worth moving ahead. So yeah, the difference between old-fashioned automation. Just one slide on what uh, Industry 4.0 is about, or questions about what it's about. We talk about things like automation, robotics, personalized manufacturing. I mean, those have all been around for a million plus years. You order a car, that's personalized manufacturing. You order the color you want, the mags you want, the hi-fi you want. I mean, that's all been around forever. So is that Industry 4.0? The same thing. I mean, network devices, the cloud. I mean, we've been storing data on network farms forever. Yet suddenly a few years ago, somebody turns that, you know, comes up with the word, the cloud, and everything changes. Has it really changed? So I'm questioning that, is this industry 4.0 or not? Or is it all of the above? And probably, in my opinion, the big difference between everything on the left side and industry 4.0 is that to me, industry 4.0 is data. We use data, preferably big data, to automatically make decisions about what is going on in your life, in your manufacturing, and so on. If it's not using data to make decisions for you, well, then it possibly is all the fashion automation, and that's just that. So, yeah, this is the, the, the Warren Bennis quote where the factory of the future will have your two employees, a man and a dog, and the man's there to feed the dog, and the dog's there to stop the man from touching the equipment. So somebody was worrying about the dog's taking the dog. But, you know, is that what Industry 4.0 is about? Is, you know, of the future being using artificial intelligence in new and different ways. So that leads us on to additive manufacturing, which has also been around for 30 plus years. And just a couple of bullet points on what, what it's about or what makes it different from conventional manufacturing. It is really good at making complex parts, the geometrically complex parts that you could not make any other way, and with no need for tools. I mean, if you have an idea for a product, conventionally, you're going to have to spend 10,000, 20,000, 100,000, half a million dollars tooling up to get it to market. With additive manufacturing, it removes that tooling cost. So you can go to market with zero startup cost, or zero, little startup cost compared to with conventional manufacturing. You can make components that are substantially lighter in the old-fashioned way. When I say substantially lighter, easily 30% lighter, typically 60 to 90% lighter. That means if you've got to ship them around the world, again, you add value by doing that. Um, being able to, so additive manufacturing, we're making components, let's say glasses for everybody in this room. With conventional manufacturing, they all have to be the same. You've got one set of frames to choose from, or maybe 10. With additive, every set of frames can be entirely different, and it doesn't make any difference to the cost. So mass manufacturing, or mass customization is what we're talking about. And decentralized manufacturing. So I thought I'd just give you a few slides with a few examples of what I'm talking about. Um, these were um, Taylor Gray, one of our students at the uh, University of Auckland, who two years ago did this as his uh, fourth year project. He's an avid mountain biker, and he created these topology optimes, these lightweight brake calipers for mountain bikes that weigh 45% less than the equivalent machine component. Now, they cost about three, 400 bucks to print. The conventional ones cost about 200, 250 bucks to print for high quality stuff. But that's a minor cost. People spend crazy money on mountain bikes. I mean, stupid money. So to spend an extra 50 bucks to save those grams, which is the difference between winning and losing a race, makes it a high enough value proposition that it is worthwhile doing. So that's one example of that sort of uh, that lightweight manufacturing. I talked earlier about the ability to, to get products to market with no tooling at all. Um, this was something, I've actually got one of them over here. This was something we did with St. John Ambulance and also with an ambulance company in France. So, Ambulance drivers, when they carry drugs, they, ca they have a foam pouch on their belt with all their bottles of whatever drugs they carry in there. And every once in a while, they break a vial because the foam doesn't offer all that good protection. And then they've got to do three days of paperwork explaining where the drugs have disappeared to. So it's a paperwork that's a problem rather than losing the drugs. So they came to us and said, look, we want to design a heavy duty drug pouch. 
and I'll just grab it from over here. So that's a little 3D printed drug pouch. So within, the, within a time span of three weeks, we did seven design iterations. We started off with this one over here with five vials. We gave it to them the next day. They said, that's not my files. We need seven vials and nine vials that kept growing in, in their different size vials. But being able to go through seven different design iterations in three weeks and then produce a hundred products for them to trial. Now to produce a hundred products any other way is basically impossible or would cost a lot of money to get there. So this is again where you're adding value by being able to go to market very, very quickly without a great cost. So currently those hundred uh, ones are being trialed. If they work, they may need another 200, so 300 in total for New Zealand. Again, you couldn't manufacture that any practical way, any other way. And we've dropped this quite a few times with, uh, there's a uh, catamine, catamine and adrenaline, adrenaline, adrenaline in there, and they haven't broken so far. So, so far, so good, we've been lucky. Um, so would that be more eco-friendly in this place? Um, yes, in the sense that if they're well-designed, they will last forever. Now, I've got to put that in quotes because, yeah, it, yeah but well-designed products are more eco-friendly eco because people use them for longer. Disposable products are less eco-friendly. And the soft pouches, they break, they tear, so they do dispose of them quite a bit. But yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I wouldn't swear on that on my life. It really depends on the application. Um, we talked about mass customization. Now, medical is a big area for that. Our bodies are all different. So anything that needs to fit in our bodies or against our bodies benefits from additive manufacturing because you can make them all uh, different. Hearing aids, 96% of inner ear hearing aids are 3D printed today. Most of us don't know, we don't care how they're made, we just care that they fit us perfectly. Uh, Invisalign dental aligners, the new way of lining up your teeth instead of the railroad track going down your mouth. Mm -hmm. Smile Direct have been advertising on New Zealand as well. Now, again, take it with a grain of salt. It's not entirely 3D printed. They 3D print models of your teeth and vacuum form over that, then CNC machine around. So it's true modern manufacturing using the right technology. And I thought I'll give you one more example of that from COVID. Uh, wrong, wrong mouse button, yes. Um, application called Bellus 3D. It's an iPhone app where you take your iPhone, hold the app, look left, look right, and it generates a 3D model of your face. And down the bottom right, you see a little mask filter button. So this was to do with all the, the, the cloth masks that we were wearing that didn't seal properly. And this automatically prints you out and come back. This automatically prints you out a little frame. I'm doing well. Explosive. I'll put them sideways. So it prints you out a little uh, frame that fits your face perfectly and seals the mask against your face the right way. A really nice example of mass customization. You can print these out on the desktop printers at home. And the last example is we talk about the supply chain. You have distributed manufacturing. Before the Industrial Revolution, this was a supply chain. If I was a maker of chairs, well, I was the supply chain. Claire may have been the blacksmith and you trade some eggs, and then you guys as the village are my market. The village on the other side of the hill too far. Compare that to the supply chain today. I'll drive to Target to buy my chair. They get it shipped in from Tauranga, and then that comes in from Guangzhou in China. That supply chain is phenomenally large and expensive. And typically, consumer product, less than 10% of the cost of the product is the product. The other 90% is that phenomenal supply chain. The transport, every one of these guys wants 5%, 10%, 30% to make their margins. So imagine in the future being able to go back to that pre-industrial revolution supply chain and being able to go back to you know, manufacturing parts where they're needed, when they need it. So I walk into Target with my memory stick with my chair design on it. Please, can you print me a chair, go have a cup of coffee, come back and my chair is done. Now the technology is not there to do that yet, but that is the dream. But one area of growth is the spare parts. Companies keep, keep billions of dollars of spare parts on shelves. I did a lot of work with Tetra Pak in Sweden. In Lund, they have a warehouse with 800,000 unique spare parts sitting on shelves doing nothing with them. Legally, they have to keep them for 20 years. And they quite freely admit that at, at, the, at the end of the 20 years, around 70% of the components get scrapped. So they legally, there are some components, seals, gaskets, they send out all the time. Others never get needed, but they need it. So imagine no longer needing to have all those components and having a digital inventory, making the parts where you need them, when you need them. So you don't ship them around the world. You ship a digital file around the world and make them where they're needed. So as I said, this is stuff that is coming. It started a lot of companies that expressed interest in this whole idea of making you know, digital spare parts. But to bring it back, I guess, to um, you know, additive manufacturing and industry 4.0, how the two tie back together. And I thought I'd illustrate this 
with an example. We're doing a lot of work with prosthetics. And in fact, on the table there, and this little girl here missing the bottom half of her arm, wearing a 3D printed prosthetic. Now this is not an intelligent prosthetic. It is one with myoelectric implants to control a bionic hand, but one problem with prosthetics, particularly lower limb prosthetics, during the day, your limb can swell or contract by as much as 20%. So they have to continuously tighten and loosen the, the, the straps to keep the, uh, the prosthetic on tight. And there's always a problem, particularly again with lower limb prosthetics, of uh, uh, pressure ulcers, where there's too much pressure and they get, you know, they become sore and infected. So this is a problem that can partially be solved by prosthetic, um, by um, uh, industry 4.0, by additive manufacturing, by being able to make compliant prosthetics. So basically spring-loaded prosthetics that will automatically change size during the day as your limb swells and contract. But it's not really taking advantage of electronics. So I guess the dream of the advanced prosthetic tomorrow is the whole um, prosthetic embedded with sensors measuring temperature, pressure, gauge, you know, accelerometers measuring what you're doing with it. All that data gets uploaded to the cloud and not just from one person, but these are all the lower limb prosthetic wearers around the world. You get all this data coming through saying, when are they getting these pressure, pressure ulcers? Is it because they're climbing stairs or whatever the scenario is, but from this data, you try to mine what's causing these. From that mine data, you now redesign the prosthetic and automatically redesign. You have that software taking that data saying, in this situation, something occurs, let's automatically change the design, print a batch of them for 100 people overnight in the countries there and send them out to them. So as I said, this is to my mind the dream of what Industry 4.0 in the context of additive manufacturing is. And additive manufacturing adds value because it's one of the few technologies that can actually do what the dream wants us to do with it. Um, so yeah, are we there yet? The short answer is no, not quite yet. I mean, additive manufacturing is still an expensive technology. It's slow, therefore expensive. They've got to use it for the, use it for the right reasons. Um, we need automated systems. So while I was talking to people earlier, right now, if three of us print three parts, we're all going to get different results because the machines are entirely stupid and they depend on the user to decide what way to print the part, orientation, material, everything. We need software that automatically decides the application based on that application. It does everything automatic and guarantees consistency and quality depending on what it is we're after. So you know, we've started working on some manual systems doing that. We now need to automate that, bring that back into the CAD to automatically do the redesign for us. And post-processing as well. I mean, the work you do after the part is printed, you do, you do not get iPhone quality parts off the printer. You've got to do a lot of elbow grease to get it to that level. Again, automating that through robotic systems, advanced robotics, a bit of artificial intelligence saying which parts need to be um, uh, you know, advanced in what way. So um, really, um, you know, we're not that far away. You know, is it another year, another two years? Certainly in the next five years, I think these issues will resolve, resolve themselves in, in quite a nice way. And maybe just to finish off, really, I, I guess a bit of advertising, really. I mean, I've, I've bought a bunch of eye candy over there for those of you who are not familiar with the more advanced 3D printing uh, products out there. But we've now, in particular, just got a new full color 3D printer. So I think if you guys have got an interest in 3D printing in color, and that is the kind of stuff you can do where you can print in full color. Um, this face uh, will actually open facial recognition on not iPhones, but on Android phones, it will work. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the iPhone, so you will notice on the table here, I've got some printed eyeballs. And the reason for that is the iPhone needs you to pay attention. Um, so the next step is to carve out the eyes and putting mobile eyes in it to see if we can, so the plan is we want to see if we can fool the iPhone into opening from a printed face um, to see if it does it the right way. So yeah, work in progress, watch this space. But if any of you guys have got an interest, open invitation to come by the lab. We've got an open week during Tech Week in May. There's flyers on the table, look at those. And I think that's pretty much it for me, other than that I look forward to seeing what Paul and Robert have to say. Um, you know, to educate me a bit, but to tell me that manufacturing is part of Industry 4.0, I hope. So thank you very much. It's almost like you've done that before. Good adding the timer there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, mate. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, so I got a lot from that. I'm wondering what you got from that. Um, what did you learn? What are you going to follow up on? 
while we get the uh, very um, soothing and tranquil sound out of the way. <laughs> Whose timer is it? Ah, oh, there we go. Excellent, thank you very much for that. <laughs> um, so yeah, so if you've got something from that, um, could I encourage you to grab somebody near you and have a quick exchange? What did you take from it? What are you going to follow, follow up on if you walk? I'm definitely going to that. <laughs> <laughs> so generic, but like, I like the bit about the supply chain, yeah. about how... Yeah, you, you don't know, have to wait. Yeah. So, like, yeah, the yeah. cost, like, is now, like, it's coming, like, like from countries. I know, and then that ship gets stuck in the Suez Canal, and it's like, ah, oh. <laughs> 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 And then how much you have to pay for it as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is crazy. And also, like, there's, like, my personal problem is, like, um, I can't find the shoe rack that's going to stay in my home where, like, I can hide the shoes. Yeah, no, I know what you mean, yeah, yeah. It's quite small. Uh, no, not yet. Wait, could you? Sorry. Yeah, I know what you mean. I, I live in an apartment. Yeah, I try to find, you know, not other issues, right? That fits like that. Yeah. Just three Yeah. 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 I actually must like, be able to that because all the library has 3D printers and they're like pretty cheap to you and you can just get like a 3D model you can go into a 3D model thing and design it yourself but like you can go into a 3D modeling program and like design the thing yourself alright folks let's wrap that up bring it back in again oh okay if it's too big maybe not but like you could do it at all I'm going to go for, uh, for three shout outs again Let's see what what are the room here. Who wants to share what they uh, what they just shared, their key takeaway, and something they're going to follow up on? Who's first? Boom! I've got one over here. Dots connected. That's one. Can I have a two? Awesome. Susan. Three again. <laughs> uh, the uh, the Evergreen the ship got, got stuck in the Suez Canal. What did that? So we had just printed it this morning. Oh, dang. <laughs> right. Maybe not quite Localized a TV manufacturing. Yet, but, yeah. Collapsing yeah. Those, uh, those supply chains left and right. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Professor Olaf. Um, ladies and gents, uh, having a good night? Was that interesting? Was that good? Worth coming out for? All right, but wait, we've got more. <laughs> um, so tonight I have the very great pleasure to introduce uh, Robert Blush who is the Callahan Innovation Customer Manager. Um, he focuses on high value manufacturing businesses. And prior to this, um, Robert analyzed global innovation trends and market dynamics to help New Zealand businesses identify opportunities and challenges. He specializes in advanced manufacturing, a rapidly evolving sector where digital technologies, industry 4.0 and 3D printing create growing commercial opportunities. Who's up for commercial opportunities? Hell yeah! There you are. Awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, please, hands together for Robert. that we're going to go through 
I'm giving those 15 minutes today. Uh, first question, quite a big one, why Industry 4.0? Second question, sounds a bit like Tina Turner. Uh, what's Lean got to do with it? And uh, third question would be, yeah, where, where do we start with that um, digital lean or Industry 4.0? And so, yeah, when we come to Industry 4.0 or the fourth industrial revolution, uh, people often start giving you that history lesson of what the other three revolutions um, would have been. And I don't really want to do that today. Um, I want to focus on where we're at right now, which is then obviously somewhere around Industry 3.0, and um, look at what might be changing if we really go towards Industry 4.0. And yeah, a bit of a spoiler alert, similar to what Olaf said in the first talk, it is all about data, and I'd add it's data and networks that, that make Industry 4.0 um, really come to life. And then, of course, um, technologies are playing a big role in that as well. Um, they are kind of the key enabler, and there's a range of technologies um, that are often yeah, labeled as Industry 4.0, and as Olaf pointed out, um, a lot of those technologies have been around for longer than about industry 4.0. One of the um, key technologies, I think, is the Internet of Things, um, which conceptually um, yeah, consists of three layers where we've got, at the bottom, we've got the things, the physical things that are with us in, in the physical world. Then we um, add sensors to them, which um, allows them uh, to transmit the data, which we connect into the networks. Um, which we then can turn into that data, can, can turn that data into um, decisions. But the big question within the Internet of Things framework is, what about the relationship between those things in the physical world? And the other question, what about the life cycle of things? In other words, where are those uh, things coming from? How are they made? Uh, and where are they, they, they going to? How are they maybe recycled? And so it's those two perspectives that Industry 4.0, or the frameworks of Industry 4.0, are adding to the um, uh, Internet of Things framework. And if we think back to Industry 3.0, factories really used to be quite hierarchical. Um, so we had the machines, and the machines even had control systems, so it was kind of smart machines. And they would be um, organized into workstations, and those workstations might be and grouped into factory lines, and we'd have the enterprise, kind of the rest of the business sitting on top of that. And there was data exchange and, and communication, but typically um, just between uh, each of those layers. And importantly, the products were part of that, of that communication as well. So if we look at what Industry 4.0 is proposing here, it's really changing that hierarchy into, a, into one connected which means the factory becomes a flexible factory, um, which is connected to the world, which means connected to suppliers, connected to uh, distributors, and importantly, the uh, products are connected as well. And now we can have communication between each of those, um, or each of those participants individually. And that might sound like a, a really big thing that only uh, big corporates um, are gonna invest in, but actually, um, it's not far from here, a company called Mastip, um, focusing on hot runner systems. They had the situation that financial data was suggesting that um, they, they should be able to make some improvements in their productivity, but they realized where they wouldn't have data to realize where to start. Even. And so what they did basically was keeping their old equipment, or their, their proven equipment, and adding sensors to them, and um, basically collecting that data from those sensors into a dashboard, which then at one central point um, basically tells them at any point in time how production is going, where bottlenecks are emerging, and so they can make um, decisions about production timely and um, where, where, where they are needed. The second thing uh, besides those hierarchies is um, in terms of the product life cycle. And Product value chains, as, as Olaf pointed out, uh, these days, or in Industry 3.0 in particular, can be quite long and they, they are quite linear as well. And 
So you start designing, then you produce it, you deliver it to the customer, and then the customer uses it and eventually um, disposes the product. Maybe you um, had some customer service in between. And it's essentially a sequence of value added steps um, in a waterfall structure. So you design first, then you hand it over to production and so on. And the, the real goal is optimizing that speed to market, so shortening the product value chain. Instead, what Industry 4.0 is, is proposing is to create that value network where we have multiple um, connections between the different stages, which essentially means we're creating that value network. It is much more iterative and agile, so we'll have designs and we'll, we'll keep improving on those designs. And the key is not necessarily um, shortening the, the, the chain, but really optimizing for the value. And what that means in particular is Industry 4.0 is creating uh, new business models or new types of business models. One of them being product as a service um, or equipment as a service, which means you're not necessarily buying your machines in the manufacturing shop floor anymore, but you're basically buying the service uh, that that machine is delivering. So you pay per part rather than having to um, front up that, that capital um, expenditure. A second type of business model is really that user-driven and customization business model, which um, where, where 3D printing, of course, plays a, a huge role um, in enabling that. Um, and one company that has done really well in experimenting um, all sorts of things in that space is um, Adidas, which isn't kind of the high-tech um, company might think of industry 4.0 um, refers to, but they've um, rolled out over the last three years to, uh, concepts like a speed factory, which would produce, uh, which would reduce the um, speed to market basically from what used to be 15 months into one week from design to, to the finished shoe. Now you might ask when will we get one of those speed factories in, in, in New Zealand? Um, well, they've shut down the ones that they had but in the process, they've learned so much about their materials and about the manufacturing processes that they are on to the next experiments. And um, for example, now using sustainable materials or using um, plastic from the oceans into making, making sports shoes. Um, the third part of business model is platform models. And again, um, 3D printing is, is coming our way. Um, 3D hubs is uh, one of those models where the, the proposition was that basically anybody um, who has a 3D printer can become a manufacturer by, by uh, through being connected to that platform. Now they've um, pivoted slightly and have realized that not everybody who has a 3D printer is a manufacturer, um, but still um, they've got I think 240-ish uh, manufacturing locations around the world and you order your part and, and you get it from one of them. The second question, remember uh, Tina Turner, um, what's Lean got to do with it? The common element here, I think, is really that focus on, on the value that is um, yeah, really critical in Lean, that we, we are distinguishing between what are value adding of the activities, whereas, whereas the base happening. And researchers have analyzed how Toyota has done things, and they came up with those uh, 40 principles, for example, that can be grouped into, into those four categories. Often we think of lean as yeah, really those process tools, but it's important to stress that the other dimensions, the philosophy behind it, the longer term thinking, as well as the people focus, and even how you approach problem solving is equally important if you want to be successful in lean. And I'd say that's, uh, that applies to Industry 4.0 as well. One of the techniques that, that is being used is what's called value stream mapping. And it is basically consists of two parts, which is analyzing the material flows and values associated with um, making transformations of that material along the, along the chain, basically. And the other part is information flow. And uh, what we basically can say here, if we think about industry 4.0, it's obviously the amount of data that we have, the amount of information will increase. So that's where we're gonna see the a big change basically in terms of what lean even looks like if we apply it to an industry 4.0 concept. One of the, the um, sort of 
approaches if you take um, really embrace lean as a company is that idea of kaizen where you make those the series of small steps of improvements that over time will give you that big impact if we think about industry 4.0 um, that's probably not quite how we can get there because what is asked from us is to embrace those new technologies and uh, that probably will lead to a different kind of lean which is less known which is called kaikaku which is giving really those step changes but the flip side of that is those step changes are not going to come from the people on the shop floor that are embracing the lean and the kaizen approach but it has actually it has to be the leaders in the business um, that are embracing the kaikaku approach and therefore leading the charge on the industry four and strategy If we think about um, what really makes a company um, successful and what could give leaders uh, an idea of where they start with their journey, um, I want to refer to um, Goran Roos, um, who hopefully many of you would have come across at some point. And he, in a, in a podcast with, with Hera um, last September, um, basically described the sources of competitive advantage really being having something that nobody else has being able to use that something more, more than once. And then last but not least, um, it should be relevant to your strategy and you also should be able to um, kind of protect that so that others can easily copy what you're doing. And when you think about what um, sort of fulfills these um, three premises, it is brands, processes, systems, and people with unique capabilities. So for the last question in terms of where do you start, I really want to look at, at those capabilities. And the concept of capabilities is uh, quite interesting because it's quite an abstract one. But it is, it is basically describing what the company does in order to deliver value to its customers. It's not how we do it, but it's what we do. And the good thing about that what is, it doesn't change so often over time. The how we do it might change, but the what doesn't. In order to make that what um, a reality, of course, we need the people. So we need a who element. We need a process around it, which then is talking about the how. We need information and we need um, technology. And it's around that um, people process and information element where we've kind of seen the, the lean journey um, lead us to. And it is that information and technology element that the industry four basically is um, adding to that to that spectrum. And as a company, if you're doing that well, then you're not only um, delivering customer value, but you're hopefully also achieving your business goals. And those business goals should then define key metrics, which um, will allow you to measure your work capabilities. So in other words, um, what is asked from us if we're looking to start that industry four journey is developing our capabilities towards industry four. And we should do that in a way that we can measure whether we're on the right track or not. And so to summarize, um, I'd like to um, propose the answers to the three questions. So why industry 4.0? It is to unlock that flexible production network and allow those new product value networks um, to happen. What's Lean got to do with it? Well, it is that clear um, focus on the value and as, as opposed to the base that um, Lean is trying to reduce. And where to start? We think a good way of starting is really getting clarity in the business, what it is you're trying to do and how you're adding value to your, to your customers. Identify those capabilities and um, yeah, look at how you can and if you are interested in that, I've got 20 minutes left to plug the end. 20 seconds, sorry. Um, we've just uh, launched a program which is called um, Digital Lean uh, at Callahan Innovation. So if anybody in the room is interested in uh, talking to me about it, um, please do so afterwards. Thank you very much. Ausgezeichnet. Yeah. All right, yeah, that means very well done. Is that cool? Like car pie.
awesome. Thank you very much, Robert. Can you give him another round of applause? Thank you. That's awesome. Oh, Lean is like, I've got a love affair with Lean. So when you say, what's Lean got to do with it? Um, who's, who's up for a very, like a 30 second Lean exercise? Oh, yes. Yeah? All of us. Yeah. All right, cool. Especially the introverts. <laughs> okay, introverts, you're going to hide. It's, it's, it's cool. This is actually really cool. It's super fun. It's going to get a little loud in here, though. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is, is get you to think about uh, uh, the first five numbers in the number set, right? One, two, three, four, five. And then you're going to think about A, B, C, D, E, so first five letters. And then I'm going to get you to think about five colors in, in, of your choice, all right? So the first thing you're gonna do in exercise one, we're gonna get you to just say those out loud at your table while you're sitting there, out to the air, all right? One, two, three, four, five, go. Seven, eight, two, four, six, purple, blue, green, red, green. Oh, yeah. Those colors come in a little bit more mixed up, don't they? That was awesome, okay, cool. Well done, give yourselves a round of applause. Now we're gonna do it again. This time I'm going to get you to do all three of those at the same time. So you go 1A, yellow, 2B, blue, 3, something, something, something. Everyone got it? Stand by and go. 1, 1 green, 2 purple, 3 aquamarine, 4, uh, 5 gray, 6 yellow. <laughs> It's taking a long time. Where's my project? It started ages ago. You're all fired. <laughs> You're all fired. <laughs> Thank you for indulging me. I appreciated that. Um, the, what was the big difference between the first one and the second one? More engagement. More engagement? Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Was the first one easier or harder? Much easier, right? And yet, in our businesses, we like to start everything at the same time and do more things and more busy, right? Does that equal more productivity? Hell no. So if you, next time you're hearing that song, Tina Turner, what's lean got to do with it? Hey, just remember that exercise and remind your business to slow down in order to speed up. Was that cool? Was that cool? All right. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, we have our final speaker tonight. And then we're going to be breaking for drinks and nibbles, and or no nibbles. I think you ate them all. So well done. <laughs> Thank you for that. We have no waste tonight. It's very lean tonight. Ah, we got we got four. Ah, we got more food. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, yeah, there you go. Meals two point zero. So tonight we have the very great pleasure to welcome Paul Gravitt to the stage. And um, so uh, Paul uh, has a uh, has over ten years in automation. Um, he started with motion design as a design engineer before moving to the automation engineering manager role. Um, Paul is responsible for leading his manufacturing team through product development, design and build projects, and research and development. So Paul holds a BE in MEC with first class honors. Does that mean a lot to everyone in the room? Yes. Totally yes. Means, means heaps to me. Awesome, thank you for that. Um, motion design, a little bit about motion design. Motion design specializes in designing, building, and controlling machines. Um, they offer innovative robotic, automated, and software solutions to solve business challenges. Their services include mechanical design and build, um, robot integ integration, um, custom software development, and online remote support. And they also supply dogs to keep your humans away from your machines. <laughs> I might have added that last bit on. But you can check that with your marketing department. <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Paul. It's really good to have um, that sort of industry and um, the educational sector come together. Um, I'm not used to, to speaking coming from industry. Um, it's normally smaller groups, so just bear with me if I get a little bit nervous. Um, so um, yeah, so um, as it says, um, Paul from Motion Design. Um, so I, I, I don't have a lot of experience, or I'm not, I'm not a guru in Industry 4. Um, I, I studied over 10 years ago, uh, Industry 4 was not really a big thing. Um, so I'm coming from it um, as experience-based. Um, I've been um, sort of yeah, involved in a lot of machines um, over the world and uh, implementing this in Industry 4 stuff um, even before it was termed Industry 4. Um, so some of our systems um, were sort of pre-2000 um, and doing this um, Industry 4 connectivity stuff. So 
that's where I'm coming from. Um, so uh, yeah, um, I'm going to do um, a bit of a, this is just like what motion design does. Um, I've got four things I want to cover tonight, and I'm going to ask you guys to, to let me know um, what you're most interested in. So one is um, what I or what we at Motion Design understand industry four to be, and what our customers um, want from from that. Um, the second is the approach that we take with our customers to transform their businesses uh, to industry four. Uh, the third thing is I want to cover some real life case studies. So some examples of um, industry four that we've implemented with our customers and how it's benefited them. Uh, the fourth thing is um, some of you might have seen the chocolate demo we had at Foodtech Pack Tech. Um, it's, it's showcasing industry four on top of industry three uh, layer. And so um, I got a chance to give you um, some insight into that. Um, so first up, I want to get a bit of a show of hands of how many people are from industry here tonight. So that's good, there's a, there's a few of you. And then I guess the rest of you guys are from sort of educational sort of sectors. That's cool. Um, so what are you guys more interested in? So out of those four, let's go show of hands if you're interested in all four. A few of you? Okay, most of you. Okay, so I'll cover all four rather than um, clients. <laughs> it makes it a little bit easier for me as well for all the slides. Three, one, four, two. We can do it backwards if you like. So, I didn't steal this from Callahan, but um, I saw that they did the same research that I did. So that's really good. Um, it's just sort of showing that uh, that path. Um, so, what we understand industry four to be, what I understand industry four to be, is um, we can sort of basically break it down to one one word, and that's connectivity. And so we're talking about data, we're talking about analytics, we're talking about this. It, it's that connectivity. And so when we look at it, it's it's connecting the, the cyber world and the physical world. So that, that cyber physical, it, in practical terms, it's your IT department and your OT department. So it's, it's what's happening in your ERP, what's happening in your ordering system, and then what's happening on the factory floor. So it's the office and the factory, it's the, the, the machine and the worker, it's, it's this connectivity where the data flows around and back and, and is off and that's saying, it's, it's the data making changes on the physical stuff. And so whether that's automated or whether that's through people making those decisions on, on, on improving things, um, but yeah, it, it's got to have that, that continuous loop of improvement. Um, it's more than just digitalization of data. It, it is taking that data and, and making change. Um, so in a, in a quote term, it's real time delivery of useful data to adjust physical systems. Um, so the approach that, um, Oh, so yeah, and on the other side of things, so that's the connectivity side, the, the, the cyber physical. There's the physical side of things as well, which Olive has talked about, the additive manufacturing. Um, it's making a huge um, gains, um, making big changes for industry um, in manufacturing. Um, on top of that is the robotics and automation, which um, is more my background. Um, and so we're seeing big changes in, in collaborative robots and vision and, and different technologies there that they have been around for a long time, but they're being very expensive and not very accessible. Whereas nowadays, it, it's becoming more of a thing. I mean, put your hand up if you haven't heard about cobots. I mean, it, it's out there. A couple of people. But, you know, like, it's, it's big. It's out there. And, and so it's changing. And everyone we talk to, they're like, oh, we want one. And you're like, well, is it, is it best for you? Maybe not. But people want one. It's interesting, you know. And it's affordable. It's becoming a lot more affordable. Excuse me. Cobot for me is... <laughs> so taking a robot, making it collaborative, so it can work around humans safely. Yep. Cool. So the the approach that we take. Um, so um, yeah. So uh, this is a slogan that we sort of think um, we sort of follow. Think big, start small, scale fast. And so we we want people to think um, long term. So not just the immediate. It's it's okay. Plan what you want to be as a company or a business. In, in five to years time and, um, and and work your way towards that and start small so the big thing is um, is trying to find that value but it's it's designing for um, meeting your end goal so um, a lot of our customers will say look I, I want to go paperless and you can't do that overnight there's there's a series of steps like we're saying that, that Kaizen um, you know it takes small steps to improve and so but you need to know where you're heading you can't just go oh let's just do this and do this and, and make see if that improves things it's, it's where's my end goal and, and work my way towards it. So we follow a, a little acronym called ACTIVE, um, which we've sort of termed. Um, so A is assess. So that's that first thing of going, what is the big picture? Where are you going? Um, where's your value adding? Uh, you know, um, and, and how do I get there? 
The second thing, concept. So ideas. Start thinking of ideas on how to get there or how to fix some of the problems that you're facing. The third thing is trial. T. Um, start small. Prototype. Find value. Um, don't you know? Jump out and go right. Okay, we're going to do this massive system up front. So start small and see if it works, and then add value, add value, and, and do this scale fast. Okay. Uh, fourth thing: implement. Build it. Do it. Get it done. Fifth thing: verify. Does it work? So when you are built this machine or built this bit of software, kit, does it do what you're asking it to do? If it does, cool. But the last thing is to evaluate. And so. You might have designed a machine to do something, or, or you might have done some software and it's producing something, but it might not be best for business. It might be not, not be the best thing for that end goal, and so you need to reevaluate things. And the other thing to be thinking about is, especially that, that startup step, is your technology platform. Because you're going to plan for you know this end goal out here, and you're going to grow and you're going to develop, don't start with systems that are going to limit you from going forward. And so, unfortunately, that can come a bit of a cost, and so that can be a bit of an inhibitor um, for some people. But there's 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 the new you know the new cloud um, rather than having you know servers and databases and, and things on site, which allows you to to kickstart really quickly. And so, just think about how you want to start, how you want to move forward, and that end goal. Um, there's other things to think about: uh, database versus Excel spreadsheets. Um, might have you might have heard about the latest Excel debacle with uh, the UK COVID cases. Um, you know, it's a big problem. Oh no, there's only 65,000 lines. And so anything over that, they got culled. <laughs> and so you need to think about these things when you're, when you're developing. Um, you need to think about your hardware as well. Uh, IoT, PLC, PC, um, which is gonna be best for gathering that data, analyzing it, and then feeding it back through your system. Um, most traditional systems in New Zealand run off PLCs. A lot of those don't have network capability. And so how are you going to feed that information back in to make your machines or things change of the, the physical? Um, let's jump into some case studies. Um, time's not going, so I don't know how I'm doing, but we'll just carry on. Um, <laughs> that's all good. We'll be here all night. Um, so um, I've got two case studies for you. Um, they are quite different. One's uh, definitely in manufacturing. One's more sort of um, away from manufacturing, but along the same sort of lines. So this, this one is a, is a dairy industry. It is here in New Zealand. They had this goal maybe 10 years ago. They want to go paperless. They, they had a lot of paperwork flying around and things got lost and missed and, and you know, torn and things. They said, want to go paperless. They want to increase their throughput. Um, they're currently doing about 60,000 samples a day. Um, it's, you know, it's a fair number. Um, and they wanted visibility. They wanted to be able to see what was happening. You know, with that much um, stuff going through their plant, through their lab, um, they want to be able to trace it. They want to be able to see where it goes and, and, and find out how the machine's going, how the people are going. And so those are their goals. We developed our first system for them in the year 2000, and that essentially was industry four. So it received data from their database, the machine altered itself uh, or did certain things based on that data, and then it reported back to the database um, on what it did and how it went and where things are, etc. And so that was you know, one of our first implementations of industry four before it was really coined um, industry four. Um, from then, we added a lot of more machines. Uh, we added automated digitalization, so gathering the data from all of those machines. We automated machine configurations, so depending on what um, process, what things are coming through those machines, they adjusted to suit um, those samples. Uh, we've got uh, techs um, going to technicians when machines go down, it locks machines out so operators can't run them. Um, there are uh, live dashboards on TV screens all around the place so people can see how they're tracking and they can make adjustments. Um, and, and all that is making a huge change for them. Um, they're able to get all that visibility and, and make changes live. So the things on the, the screens on, um, showing that live data, it is live, it's instant. And so they can make changes like that. Um, then, um, so the, the, what we've recently um, implemented is we're gathering all this data, we're analyzing it, um, you know, some of the machines are doing things. They wanted more visibility as to, um, you know, reporting on. So they can gather that data, they can do their own reports, which probably most of you do through Excel or something else. Um, so we automated that process. So automated the analyzing of data, automated the generation of reports, um, so they could drill down and then they could use that to um, improve things. So the big one was 
they, they estimated about 15% downtime on their machines and their staff. And they didn't really know why, because the operators would tell them something, and it wasn't really you know, very, very good um, to hit uh, what they said. And so they said, right, well, we actually want to analyze it. So we, we did that, we did the reports, we did the KPIs, and now they can drill down. And so that, um, they managed to, the benefits was that they reduced that, um, that down, I can't remember what the percentage is now, but it's, it's, you know, it's single digits. But the big thing was they, had, they went to, from three shifts down to two. So drastic change, you know. <laughs> it's a third, third savings in, in your labor costs, your running costs, et cetera, um, from the improvements that they were making. Um, and that includes sort of servicing and things as well. So what they learned was um, by slowing down and sort of taking note, the machines were able to um, last longer and be more productive rather than pushing them very hard. And so you know, that really helped them. Um, and there's less demand and less frustration for, for operators. They didn't have to you know, meet certain quadro or things. They, they had visibility to see. And surprisingly, they like the KPI data on the screens. They go asking their bosses for the report to see how they did. Um, so there's this whole talk of, oh, big brother's watching. Um, but in their situation, big brother is coming alongside them and helping them. So they can identify, oh, look, Joe Bloggs is new on the machines. They need some help because for the last you know, day or two, they've taken five minutes to work on, um, on fixing a particular problem. So let's give them some training. Um, and they like that. The second uh, case study I want to quickly go through uh, is a steel company uh, in Australia. And they had similar goals. They wanted to go paperless. They wanted to reduce downtime. They had their traceability, reduce rework, um, which I'm guessing a lot of you sort of in industry might, might see as well. They wanted that visibility um, as well as one of their goals. Uh, they have 23 sites. Um, yeah, so they've got 23 sites, over 200 machines. Um, all of those machines were different types, different manufacturers. So the first thing they did was say, look, we're gonna standardize the control system. So we help them um, basically write, write a new system for it goes on every machine, uh, standardize how, how they operate. Um, then on top of that, we started um, adding in a, a custom MES, uh, which integrated with the ERP systems and the machines. So orders could come straight from the ERP system through into the machines, and the machines can pretty much make your product themselves. Um, it was very limited, uh, very little sort of human interaction, and because the machines are the same, you could just send your operators to any machine to run it. Um, so it, it made it a lot more efficient. They, um, we also did, um, uh, yes, yeah, so, so recently what we did for them is identifying rework um, that uh, they had to do. So they, they knew there was um, a huge amount of rework that they were doing. Um, and at some sites it was, it was like 10 grand a month um, of rework. And they suspected it was because customers were um, essentially ripping them off and going, oh look, it's, it's arrived damaged, you need to make me some new ones. But they couldn't conclusively say it, it was that. And so we did, um, looking at our data and things, we were able to work out where it was going. We managed to work out that, yeah, a lot of portion of the rework is due to transportation costs and site damage, which they can't control. So we helped with them to develop an app to um, essentially pull up all the data we had already on, on each job and you could photograph it various stages of the process. So when things were getting loaded up on the truck, you could take a photograph, you could scan it, um, and instantly that data was available to everyone. And so the benefits meant that the um, customers knew exactly where the product was at all times. Um, they, um, they reduced their rework um, at, at many sites by over 50%, um, which, you know, in that one site alone, that's, that's five grand a month saving. Um, they, they had buy-in because we developed the system with the end users, so the people on the floor that were going to be using the app, um, they helped to develop it. Um, they were confidently res um, could confidently respond to claims um, of missed, uh, missed parts or damaged parts because they had a record uh, and they had traceability. Um, some side benefits were that um, the customer relations actually got better. Um, they expected it to sort of get worse because, you know, you don't want to sort of <laughs> Have people turn up and be like, oh, you know, um, my thing's missing, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, well, no, it's not, because we can prove that it's not. Um, it improved those relationships. Um, they got live updates, they got an engaged workforce. As we know, the younger generation like to be on their phone a lot, um, so this was a good excuse for them to be on it. Uh, and traceability, so they could trace products right back to the raw product 
right back to the coil or the steel that they were putting into their products. Um, so it, it, filled, it fulfilled that life cycle. Um, so there's the app. Just quickly, um, some of you might have seen this. This is the chocolate demo that I was, um, uh, was on Food Tech, Pack Tech. Um, so this sort of showcases uh, industry two or industry three with an industry four layer on top. So it's taking in New Zealand businesses, um, sort of typical, um, so sort of seeing here, uh, sort of, um, on the left there, we've got a PLC, it's controlling some sensor, reading information from sensors, controlling some motors, some actuators. Um, there is a person doing some manual task in it because it was too hard to try and automate that. And we've said, okay, well, you know, let, let's just show some of the things we can add as industry four. And so we've got a vision system there to replace the human to detect chocolate colors. Um, we've potentially had to upgrade the PLC to have network capability. Um, that is talking with uh, our insight server, so that's gathering the data, showing you OEE, showing you throughput, showing you data on the machine, on the orders. Um, then it can also connect up with uh, the ERP or the MES, and we've got a sequencer. So you can schedule it. So as orders come in, you can schedule to which machine it needs to go on, you can uh, prioritize, um, and you can get ETAs as well because you know um, how fast things are going from your insights, you can feed that through the system and then make adjustments to, you know, when someone asks how long is it going to take, you, you'll confidently know based on the throughput through our machines and the data we have, it's going to take this long. Um, and so that system is connected up to the ordering, so online ordering, so customers anywhere can create an order and it can go through the system, get prioritized, etc. We also added barcode scanner, so we're able to track and trace everything within the system, um, where it was going, which um, things were going into which box, um, and also we had a printer there so that once the product came out, we printed a label onto it so then that could be scanned and followed and tracked wherever it needed to go. So um, it's just sort of showcasing, um, you know, this is, this is not a product or anything, um, but it's just showing how you can take your industry to an industry three business and you can add a layer of industry four while maintaining or keeping your production line. Um, and so, yeah. Um, it's just, it, we, we're realizing more and more as we sort of meet people that the businesses are industry two and three, and they're asking for automation to stay within that. And we're trying to encourage them to come to this and, and gather that data and feed it back through, create that loop, create that connectivity so that you are making decisions based on the data. Yeah. We had a minute left, so. used to talking in front of crowds, I think you've done a sterling job. Um, we're going to go into wrap-up mode in a second. Um, I wonder if you could just share your key takeaway from the last two talks, I know we haven't done it for two, two talks, um, with somebody around you. Go. Right. I take the stream. We need a dedicated person to do sound. Why do you think that went like that? I think it's because I'm not I know, it's not else, but like. Oh, 
Next, so to all our live stream uh, viewers, thank you so much for tuning in. We're going to be closing that out now. Um, I hope you enjoyed the session. Uh, we had three amazing speakers. We look forward to seeing your comments and your questions. Um, ka kite anō?